and two decisions that they're making <clears throat> into decisions that they're making at the grocery store. Uh, as soon as you get into seafood, however, things get a little more complicated. Um, so I had the privilege this last year of working with uh, members of the NAMA team on our Food Print of Wild Seafood Report, where we did a deep dive on all of these issues, um, exploring kind of just at its most basic level, what is sustainable fishing? Uh, does it exist? Is our fisheries a way to feed people as we move into the future? Um, and beyond just food and nutrition, what do fisheries do for communities and economies? Um, we wanted to dive a little deeper into that and talk to some people who are actively involved both in advocacy work and to fish themselves. Um, so we have a great panel here uh, to talk about that with us today. Um, so introduce those quickly. Um, we have Jason Jarvis, um, who, in addition to being a commercial fisherman, uh, is the president of the board for NAMA. Um, he also is involved in Fresh Harvest Kitchen, which uh, is a fisherman and farmer cooperative in Rhode Island. Uh, we have Melanie Brown, who fishes for sockeye um, in Bristol Bay with her family. Um, we want to note that uh, Melanie and the organization she works with, Salmon State, scored a big victory earlier this week um, against the Pebble Mine Project. So we're excited to hear from her about that um, and the importance of community organizing. Um, we also have Brett Tully, who also works with NAMA as the National Program Coordinator, um, along with John Russell, who's the Food Justice Organizer for NAMA. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with both of them um, in helping me kind of detangle the complex world of fisheries policy, and they're going to be doing some of that with us today um, as well. Um, so we're going to move into our panel discussion. I want to note that if anybody has questions, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We're going to be monitoring those and kind of pooling them uh, for a Q&A section at the end. If there's anything that feels really uh, compelling to talk about as we kind of move through the discussion, we may also drop in with those. Um, if you have uh, further questions or suggestions for things that you'd like to hear at a future date, we will also have a survey um, towards the end, uh, which we'd love any feedback about. Um, so to start us off, I think the question that many people have um, at the very beginning is, do sustainable fisheries even exist? Um, fisheries, wild fisheries have been recently increasingly the victim of a lot of different narratives uh, that portray them as um, kind of archaic ways for people to get protein that are constantly ruining the ocean through pollution, overfishing and other things. Uh, that fisheries have no role in a modern food system when they can be replaced by products from aquaculture or plant-based substitutions or land-based proteins. Um, so with that in mind, we know, and most of our panel knows uh, from participating in it directly, that sustainable fisheries do exist. Um, so Jason, I want to start off with you and just ask you kind of at the 10,000 foot level, uh, what makes a fishery sustainable? Is this something that um, is determined by gear type? Are there you know, types of fishing gear or types of fishing operations that are better than others? Um, when we talk about this, um, what do what does sustainable fishery? What does sustainable mean when it comes to a fishery? Well, it's it's a, a combination of things. Um, you know, first off, the scale of the fishery, um, and then you mentioned gear types. I mean, we recently had this discussion about the difference of fisheries west coast to east coast, and certain gear types that are used on the west coast and the way they're used are absolutely sustainable like the set net fishery for salmon um whereas gill netting on our coast um if done improperly is not sustainable but if done properly is sustainable and they they get a bad rap um so i i think um the other part is we we became really good as a nation at, at marketing certain species to the point of wiping them out while ignoring species that are widely available. Um, so a lot of the sustainable fish that are out there used to be considered trash fish. Um, I always love the, the term that came up as underlove species. So now we have, um, you know, especially in Rhode Island, abundant species of fish that most people don't even know exist. 
And we've been slowly trying to market that towards the general public just to educate them that there are a bunch of fish that are readily available, affordable, and not industrial scale factory style fish, um, you know, that are caught on a 500 foot factory freezer boat. Um, so yes, um, and I mean, it's, it's a bigger question than that. It's, you know, who operates a boat, how close to home, you know, for me, it's beautiful that, I mean, I, uh, I literally live two and a half miles from the ocean and I can walk to my boat down the street from my house and launch it in the river. Um, so the closer to home that you can catch your fish and bring it to your community, that's also makes it sustainable. You know, the less carbon footprint, the less travel time, the less handling of that fish. I think that kind of sums it, at least from my corner of the world. So what I hear you saying is that this is less a uh, technical distinction about gear type than it is just kind of the general scale of fishing operations and whether or not it's tailored um, to the area in which people are fishing. Absolutely. Yeah, like, um, you know, it, it's education too. I mean, a lot of people make assumptions and, and there's stigmas around certain gear types, but yet I've been in the fishery a long time. I know that the, the people that build the trawl nets um, and how advanced we've become technologically with, uh, you know, trawlers on the East Coast. But the difference on the East Coast is we're, we're trawling in mud most of the time. Um, a lot of gear has been designed to not even touch the bottom. A lot of the squid gear um, just about floats. They have net monitors, door monitors, cameras on the nets. Um, but on the West Coast, it's very different. And, and we don't have the species that they're dealing with on the West Coast. I mean, we do have a bycatch issue here. Um, but again, if you're using the right mesh, you're, you're fishing the right areas, you, you minimize that bycatch. Um, I know on the West Coast, it's been a really big issue because some of these vessels are enormous and they're scooping up entire biomass, an entire biomass of salmon that are heading to the spawning grounds. So that impact is much larger than say a trawler on the East Coast here coming up with mud hake or whiting or a, a less useful species. Um, you know, and again, it's an issue that keeps getting addressed in all fisheries is, is minimizing that bycatch. But the, the difference is, I mean, I've seen after visiting British Columbia and Alaska, the, the amount of bycatch that happens in their trawl fleet compared to here, and it's astonishing. So very different. Yeah, I mean, I I think something people don't realize is kind of like you were saying, just the amount of um, effort that many fishermen put into reducing bycatch um, and eliminating um, all of those other negative environmental impacts, because at the end of the day, who is more invested in the long-term survival of fisheries as a resource than the people who depend on them? <clears throat> yeah, I, I uh, think that's where people you know, miss out too, is that the owner operator, the, the, the people that own their vessels and own the businesses and represent community fisheries, they're stewards of that. It, it's no different than you know, a friend of mine compared it to some of my local friends are hunters that they know more about the land around where they hunt than most of the people that live there now. And that they, they, they sustain a portion of their food supply from, you know, locally harvested wild, you know, animals. And then, you know, they raise their own chickens and things like that, but it's still just, they're a steward of that area. You know, they're very careful about what they take, how they take it, when they take it, um, and they follow the rules. I mean, it's like anything else out there, you have to follow the rules. And, and there, you know, been a lot of stigma around that, that, you know, all fishermen are crooks and pirates and thieves. And it's like, well, no, it's not true. You know, bad apples in every bunch. Yeah, you know, this was something that really surprised me um, as we were working on the report was just um, how the environmental angle when we talk about fisheries, tends to get most of the attention, uh, at least in the public eye. Uh, but this idea that, you know, 
fishermen are deeply invested in the survival of this uh, lifestyle as well, um, points to this idea that fishing is really central to so many communities. Um, and in the United States in particular, we see this long history where people get, uh, whether it's indigenous people getting displaced um, and removed from resources that they've managed sustainably for millennia, um, or in more recent years, uh, fishing communities getting displaced from consolidation. We really kind of see that um, working to the detriment of fishing communities. Um, so Melanie, I wanted to kind of pose this topic area to you. Um, as someone who fishes and also works on advocacy kind of that is centered on preserving the longevity of uh, the salmon fisheries in Bristol Bay as a resource. Um, can you talk about just kind of uh, one more generally, but also specifically kind of with your experience, uh, the centrality of having working operational fisheries in a community and what happens when those uh, come under threat? Yeah, well, I would say that, you know, like, um, a fully operational, thriving, working waterfront provides for everybody. Everybody's fed. Or, um, you know, when you're, you're talking more about the commercial fishery, everybody's paid. But in, in the, the fishery that I participate in in Bristol Bay, I, I uh, set net in the uh, Naknik um, River District. Uh, in Bristol Bay, there are a number of river districts that um, permit holders can register in, but set netters, um, it's harder to move around um, and th there aren't sites available like it, everywhere. Mo most of the available fishing spots are staked out. So you can't just like pick up your gear and decide I'm gonna go move to this district or I'm gonna move and fish in, an, in another place. And, um, I fish in a, um, a spot that my great grandpa staked out and it, that uh, spot has always stayed in our family and now my children participate in that in the fishery and I myself uh, was able to pay for my education. Um, uh, uh, so that that's one way that I was I've been fed um, and have been able to provide for my family. Uh, it supplements my winter income, you know, with, with um, Salmon State uh, as a um, an organizer. But um, just just to provide a little bit more background, um, my gear type is um, set gill net, and I I fish out of a twenty foot open skiff. Um, it has has really a good hauling and carrying capacity, um, and our our tenders are close by. Our processors are close by as well, um, so our fish, you know, gets gets processed pretty pretty fresh. Um, and uh, the only bycatch that we really worry about in that fishery are uh, we get a lot of starry flounder, and they're really hard to kill. <laughs> so, so when we when we we're pulling through our gear and they come over the side, we just throw them back in the water and they just you know, flop, you know, flitter away. Sometimes we get some Chinook or King, King salmon bycatch. Um, but uh, most of the times, you know, the Chinook, they're, they're too big to get gilled in our gear. And they'll, they'll kind of lay against the gear until they're ready to sort of roll out and swim off. Um, but if we do catch them, uh, fishing game requires that we report them. Um, you know, especially if we, we plan on taking them home to eat. Um, uh, we do have the option of selling them, but it's it's hardly worth selling them. I mean, there's such treasures. Um, but so that's another way that they're accounted for. Um, but going back to thriving waterfronts, um, you know, when when you're dealing with a fully functional fishery, um, you have the the commercial fishermen that that are provided for, but also in the um, in Bristol Bay, there there's a um, there's a sport fishing community and guide community that is able to provide really high quality ecotourism to people who who can afford it. Um, and then it, there are locals that will go out and they'll they'll sport fish themselves. Um, but um, most importantly, and I I I fully feel that you know the people that should be fed first are the indigenous people who um, subsist on um, 
you know, what the salmon provide. And um, it's kind of cool. Um, so it, every time we, we go out, uh, we, we launch our skiff and then we pull it up at the end. It's kind of hard with the big high tides to, um, to just leave our, our, my skiff in the water. Um, you know, so we, we just, we trailer it when we're, we're not on the water and then launch it when we need to go back out to check the site. And um, as we're running to the site, we, we pass the, there's a senior citizen subsistence area. And then, um, you know, along the beach until you get to the commercial gear, there's um, other areas where people have um, subsistence nets out and they, they use gill net gear too. Um, and uh, the pieces are either five or 10 fathoms. And um, it's just always really nice to see people, you know, taking in fish for their, to, to help get them through the winter and to fill their smoke houses. And um, yeah, so that's, I guess my, uh, my quick overview on thriving waterfronts. Thank you for that. Um, while we have you, would you mind giving us just a very quick overview of the Pebble Mine project and the threat that it was posing to Bristol Bay and the communities in the surrounding area? Sure. So um, I was kind of in the, you know, when the Pebble Mine fight was really heating up, I was um, I was busy raising small children. And so I was I was a, somewhat late to the fight. Um, but once I started learning more about it, I um, Actually, initially, I, I, I thought that it, it seemed like a wonderful way to sort of, um, you know, uh, have another economic engine in Bristol Bay other than salmon. Because, you know, over, over, you know during my 40 years of fishing Bristol Bay, I've, I've seen a lot of rises and falls and how, um, when, you know, when we have downturns, you know, and how, how it can impact people. Um, so I thought, oh, well, this will help diversify the economy. And it's it's a huge prospect. Um, there was a mining expert that came in and spoke in, in a class that I was taking. And, and then I, I um, talked to my dad about it. My dad was like, this is a really bad idea. Um, yeah. And and I, I asked him why, and it was like the beginning of my education. Um, but it's, so the, the pebble deposit, it's massive. It's um, estimated to be about 11 billion tons of, of ore. Uh, it's, it's a big ore lens, uh, but unfortunately it's housed in really, um, it's very low grade and it's housed in sulfide rock, which when it's exposed to air and water, it generates um, sulfuric acid um, that is as strong as like car battery acid. And um, the, it's, so not only does that, you know, taint the, pristine waters of Bristol Bay, but it also dissolves any of the, the minerals, um, you know, that are present that, that uh, the acid would come into contact with. And copper is extremely detrimental to salmon. Um, even an increase of two parts per billion is enough to um, keep salmon from being able to return to their natal streams because they can't, they can't find their way it, it messes with their, you know, inner compasses uh, and olfactory system. And um, so, it, yeah, the deposit, it also, you know, is housed um, at the, the headwaters of two of the most prolific um, salmon streams in Bristol Bay, the Nushigak and the Quijak rivers. Um, so, um, you know, it stands to greatly diminish the, you know, the productivity of Bristol Bay. Um, one of the things that makes Bristol Bay so, so pristine is the fact that, um, you know, it really hasn't been developed very much outside of the villages and communities in the region. Uh, the only way to get there is to fly or boat. So, so there aren't roadways that are blocking fish passage. Um, but, you know, to develop this mine, um, a lot of roadways would have to be built. But the biggest threat um, that in my eyes is the, the fact that they, they were looking at tailings impoundments, which are huge earthen dams that are intended to hold back the tailings and mine waste. Um, and um, 
you know, people say that the probability of these, these dams breaking is low, but the consequences are very high. And um, if anybody wants to see the consequences of an earthen dam breaking, um, refer to the Mount Polly incident that happened in 2014 and, and basically wiped out a, a beautiful, beautiful habitat, um, the, the beautiful habitat of Quinell Lake in BC. Um, and, you know, also it's just, you know, if, if people are downstream, they stand to, to be impacted or swallowed up by, um, by a huge tailing stam failure. Um, I think I covered most of the high points, so hopefully I didn't take too long. But, um, oh, there's just one thing that I'd really like to emphasize. Um, my advocacy and organizing work, it started because of the pebble mine. I, um, I felt very strongly about being part of the work and I started as a volunteer and then grew into an actual employee of, an, of Salmon State. Um, but um, it's for those of you who are, who are involved in the struggle of a fight, of opposing something, please always remember that it's important to have also have the orientation and balance of building something that you want. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Melanie. Yeah, I think it's uh, the victory that uh, you all scored this week <clears throat> really is just like um, monumental considering, you know, that we're trying to outline the fact that our kind of community food sovereignty and environmental integrity isn't worth it, um, even when we're looking at these like potentially very lucrative products. Um, these lucrative projects, um, if they threaten fishing communities and ways of life that people have followed for such a long time. Um, as we think about other threats to fishing communities, one of the big ones that we see um, moving forward is corporate consolidation um, as these resources that are intended to enrich us, uh, enrich fishing communities um, and the people that live in them. We find that increasingly the rights to those fish have been captured uh, by private equity groups, foreign interests, and those resources end up just leaving the community. Um, so Brett, I wanna pose this one mostly to you. Um, we talked about this quite a bit in the report, um, how these uh, programs that we call catch share programs um, instituted through NOAA um, have been one of the main drivers of corporate consolidation that we've seen in fisheries. Um, so can you talk a little bit about just how these have hurt fishing communities and whether or not they actually benefit the fish? Like what's the guiding principle here and where did they go wrong? Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everybody, for being on here. So <laughs> what's the, the guiding principle behind catch your policy? Where did they go wrong? Let me let me just start with a, a quick personal story. So I'm, uh, I'm from a couple of generations of commercial fishing family out of Massachusetts. And when my grandfather began fishing, he did a fisheries not too different than what Melanie's doing in Alaska, what Jason's doing in Rhode Island, he had a like a 40 foot boat and he would alternate his gear type depending on the season. Sometimes he would use gill nets, other times he would use hook and line, he do some rod and reel here and there, did some pot fisheries. One of the really important species to his livelihood was ground fish. Ground fish in the Northeast is a and a grouping of fish of about 16 species that include codfish, haddock, flounder, pollock, redfish, others. So groundfish was important. When my grandfather had to purchase a fisheries permit to allow him to go ground fishing, it cost about $50. This was back in the 50s and 60s. When my father, you know, it was time for him to buy his own fisheries permit, it cost about $100. Now, don't get me wrong. It's, it's, uh, it's a big investment to get into fishing. The boat, their boats and gear and other stuff, it was, it was expensive. But just the permit to allow access to the ground fish was pretty cheap. For me, if I was to go buy a fisheries permit that would allow me the same kind of access that my grandfather had or my father had, it would be about a million dollars right now. That's because of catch share policy. 
the big like monumental shift between just one generation um, has happened for a, a couple of reasons. So the theory behind the so catch share policy, it's, it's a management tool that is used by the federal government to manage our uh, federal fish stocks. And the concept of the tool is that it's a cap and trade system. You cap the number of fish that can be removed from the ocean. You turn it into a tradable quota. And the theory is if the fleet overall doesn't exceed the total allowable catch, then we're not overfishing, we're in good shape. And fundamental to the approach is that it doesn't really matter who catches it. Could be one boat, could be a hundred boats, could be uh, somebody who's like the owner operator, or it could be a private equity firm, doesn't really matter as long as we're not exceeding that cap. And so where we're critical of the system is that in fact, it really does matter for ecological reasons, for social reasons, for economic reasons, <clears throat> all of the, the kind of the vision that, you know, Melanie was kind of describing what we're trying to build and what Jason is trying to build is like local regional seafood systems that honor the ocean and the people who catch the fish. And if that's the vision we hold, catch your policy, kind of, you know, forcing people to spend a million dollars just to, just to get into it is really a, an enormous barrier uh, to that vision. And just a couple of like, specific examples, you know, codfish uh, in the Northeast, you know, catch shares was justified because the catch, the, the cod population was pretty low. And so managers and advocates said, okay, well, the problem here is that there's a lack of, of ownership, of private property ownership. This is, gets into the tragedy of the commons kind of theory. It's that, uh, you know, that if people kind of are guided by their own self-interest, they will not do what's right for the broader community or the environment. This is a theory posed by Garrett Hardin back in 1968. And the idea behind it is that a lack of private property is what will uh, kind of like ultimately destroy the commons, whether it's a grazing field for cows or the ocean or the air, or whatever. That theory was later dispelled by Eleanor Ostrom in 2009, who won the economic Nobel Prize for kind of for saying basically like, look, people can manage the commons all over the world. Here are all the examples. She uplifted lobster fishery as one of them. The problem is not that people can't manage a commons. It's just that when there's no attempt to manage a commons, that's that's when it falls flat. So there's sort of like abuse of this like theory or the, the tragedy of the commons, like you know, perpetuating this theory that's been dispelled is what's driving catch share policy that's founded in private property that's ultimately displacing people like Jason and Mellon, independent, you know, fishing people and beginning to replace them with uh, private equity firms. We just saw recently a story break this past summer that revealed uh, this billion dollar private equity firm called Briggle, who's currently the largest uh, quota owner controller of ground fish in the Northeast. And is ultimately why it's gonna, it would cost me a million dollars if I wanted to get in because the market value of the access has been commodified, it's been privatized, and it's forcing the next generation to have to compete with you know, billion dollar you know, families, companies, and others as well. So just to sum it up, it's just, uh, you know, that, that's sort of like the problem of like how it's, it's getting off track. Um, there's nothing wrong with capping the number of fish that can be removed from the ocean, the part where it gets steered off course is the commodification, the private property aspect. If we were to remove that, we'd, we'd be okay. And just to paint like a really broad picture, catch our policy is only impacting about 17 managed, kind of like management programs of fish species around the country. There's still over 400 
other species who are not yet managed by catch shares. So there's, for us, we like, we point to uh, well-managed species all over the country that are doing pretty good. Nothing's perfect, but they're doing pretty good. And we have not like lost this battle. This is still something that's relatively new. And so we want to uplift community-based management that we see is working as the sort of North Star that we want to get to. And we want to like immediately stop catch shares enabling these private equity firms to hijack fisheries access. Thanks for that, Brett. Um, yeah, I did an interview with Lee Vandervoo, who is a journalist that wrote a big book about cat shares back in, I think, 2015 or 16. Um, and she put it, uh, she put it very well, I'm probably going to butcher it now, but she said something to the effect of like, as is what we always see happening in this great American capitalist experiment, something might start out with good intentions, but inevitably, the people with the most money and the most power are going to kind of take hold of it and use it to their own advantage. So I think that's, you know, really what we've seen happening with cash shares. Yeah, um, one quick or, and two, or just shortly that, um, you know, the, the unintended consequences is something that we do hear often from fisheries managers. They're like, oh, we, you know, we thought the program was going to do this, uh, it'd be good for the fish and good for the communities. And we, we didn't know that a private equity firm was going to come and buy up the majority of the fishing access rights in this place. But we're, we're kind of calling, calling BS a little bit on that because uh, the fishermen who are part, you know, have been part of these things for generations, saw the writing on the wall, had seen reports and research come out from other places around the world where this is happening. This is like a repeated pattern that we've seen happening for over two decades. And even before it happened in New England, there were right. fishermen who, went directly to the decision makers and said, if you put this program in place with no safeguards, you will see a billion dollar private equity firm become the dominant you know, owner in this fisheries access space. And, and that's exactly what happened. So there's a little bit of accountability there too, right? Like for any you know, folks have been, decision makers have been warned. Like this is not, this in some ways it's, it's the intended consequence. Um. I think we'll maybe get into this a little bit more later, but um, I kind of wanted to explore it here as well. Um, catchers were sold on this promise that they would help end overfishing by sort of increasing the personal responsibility that people have towards the fishery. Um, but clearly it's not the only way to manage fisheries. Um, so, I mean, what would be the preferable alternative in some of these cases to these catch share programs? Sure. So I think there's a lot of programs. So first of all, I think there's the premise that uh, the catch share policy is off right from the get go, which is that there's this like uniform one size fits all. We can have like this national framework that can apply to every person. That's just wrong. Because what we know is that every ecosystem and community and the fish cycles and their migration, they're all so unique that they all need their own tailored bottom-up management that can only be done when fishermen and scientists and managers can effectively collaborate together. It's the only way to do it. The way that shows up can be very different. I think lobster is a good example to look at, uh, looking at some like monkfish and dogfish and skate on the uh, East Coast, the salmon that, that Melanie was telling us all about, the salmon, salmon's like, that's one of the best you know, fisheries on a world level that's being managed effectively. And that's in part why it's, it's beautiful that so many people are so um, committed to sustaining it, that they're willing to fight off this massive pebble mine for it. Um, those are all great examples. None of those are managed by catch share programs. Right, so kind of because of the level of detail we need to manage a fishery well, you have to involve the people that are actually out on the water. Yeah, and maybe one of the decisions. core, you know, and Eleanor Ostrom kind of lays out these core components that are required for effective management. Uh, but one of them is sort of like the degree to which the people who are caring for the resource, in this case, the, the people who fish, uh, the closer they are to the people like being on the boats or actively fishing, the owner operator concept is very core to any management program. Once you start to lose that, 
we start to see all of these negative consequences ecologically, economically, and socially. Um, so that's like a very core component. And then this idea of like genuine bottom-up democracy, that's a really core component to these management programs too. If you don't have a lot of people, and this is messy, right? It's, we're talking about democracy. Uh, if you don't have a lot of people um, with the varying degrees of expertise kind of coming together, um, you'll lose out on effective management. That's what we're seeing with consolidation. Instead of having people with a range of historical expertise and knowledge of the ecosystem, you see people very far away who have a lot of money who want to make short-term profit. And that's what's guiding their kind of management advocacy. Um, one final question, just sort of on this same topic. Um, we're going to pivot sort of towards more of a consumer angle here um, in the next question. But I mean, we talk about this consolidation and the effect that it has on fishing communities. What, how are people seeing that at the grocery store? I mean, some of the feedback that we were getting from uh, partners that we talked to as we were preparing the report was just this idea that, you know, because um, private equity firms and others were selling their fish up these very vertically integrated supply chains, the fish themselves were just leaving communities. And so like consumer access to fish was, you know, getting bet worse unless you, purchased it at the restaurant owned by the person who owned the share. Is there kind of more to say about the consumer end of things there? Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, in general, the consumer at the grocery store won't know, won't, usually won't be able to tell if it's coming from, if it was sort of caught by a company owned and controlled by a billion dollar private equity firm uh, in New England. That's the likelihood. You see, look, yeah. like the, 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 yeah, the odds are in their favor that you are buying a fish from a private equity firm in that case. One of our criticisms of a lot of the mainstream labels that are used to kind of certify or identify fish as sustainable while being a great, you know, uh, dialogue opener to get people thinking about sustainable fishing, one of the shortcomings is that they're, they're not helping to identify who is actually behind the steering wheel, who owns and controls the fishing operation and what is their purpose for doing it. And so as the person, like the seafood eater at the grocery store, it, look at the label is great, but uh, it doesn't go deep enough, right? To get to what we're talking about that I think a lot of consumers would have a preference like their own in their own heart and their own values. They recognize that there is something off when it's a private equity firm or a large you know, faraway investment company who is controlling this fish, right? And it's one practical example. We were just in Alaska a couple months ago and uh, we got to see a halibut boat, land some halibut. And that's uh, managed by Catch Air program. And what we often see is the, the, the people who, um, you know, don't maybe own a lot of the quota, they, own their, they have to lease, like they have to rent the fisheries access and for leasing a pound of halibut, it was about $4, $4 a pound. And then when they get to the dock, they're paid $6 a pound. So that means the boat makes $2 a pound. The person who never even went on that boat gets $4, they get double, they have $4, right? And then what's interesting, when then when you like do the filet, then the fish is filleted, but like the person who didn't go on the boat it's four dollars for the whole fish, but once that's cut up, it's really like paying about fifteen dollars a pound for a fillet. So if you see, so if you're going to that restaurant and you're buying that halibut, you know, for like whatever twenty eight dollars, fifteen of that goes to somebody who never set foot on the boat, wow. right? So another way to put it, like if we move toward that more of that like owner operator, more tied folks to the boat, that halibut could be. $14 a pound if you, you know, if you didn't have that right. kind of structure. So there's a huge loss for like, you know, we talk about the accessibility and, you know, seafood's perceived as white tablecloth thing, but, you know, catch shares is just, it's sort of driving it that way. But if we could get, you know, away from these like landlord structures that are kind of taking money from the middle, we could really increase the access and affordability of seafood. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, this actually pivots very well kind of into our next question, because um, we're gonna, uh, John, I wanted to ask you just about, you know, when when people go to the grocery store, the fact that um, you're seeing all this seafood, it may or may not have labels that indicate where it's from. 
It may look fresh, it may be fresh, it may have been frozen, it might be frozen, um, could be canned. Um, but, you know, a lot of the seafood we eat at the end of the day is imported. Um, and for the average person in a grocery store, it is nearly impossible to know um, where what they're eating is coming from. Um, so why is that the case? Um, when did seafood supply chains get so complicated? Um, and in particular, um, when we get into, you know, obviously we're talking mostly about wild cut seafood today, uh, but a lot of what we see in the grocery store is also farmed seafood, often imported from abroad. Um, and so how did that sort of market structure come into being and how can people kind of navigate that and understand what they're working with, um, whether they're in the, at the fish counter or in the freezer aisle or, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I want to, I want to go off um, what you were talking about a little bit um, and just talking about how like these, the catch her system was, you know, it's like actively being manipulated to kind of optimize it for profits, do as little as possible to get as much money as possible, which is kind of the whole, you know, um, sticks and stones of a lot of these systems. Um, and think about, you know, just the food economy, like the, the economics of food in general. Um, if you think about, you know, a fish you want to have for dinner, the ideal situation is, you know, you can go up to the dock, say hi to your fishing folks who are there, grab a fish from them and cook it up. That'd be pretty cool. Um, but, you know, but then the processor can't get the money, the, all the, um, all the alphabet soup of firms uh, who verify everything can't get money, all the distributors can't get money. It's, you know, so many people missing out on money. So instead of being able to have this nice, simple system of direct marketing, there's all these like um, systems put in place to obscure that. And what actually ends up happening is 80% of all of our seafood caught domestically gets exported. And the, over, the, the majority of what we eat domestically is imported. Um, and in fact, some percentage of that is seafood that we exported and then imported back. <laughs> there are instances where people who are having their fish like imported from across the ocean, from, from Europe, the fish was caught less than 100 miles away from them but it had to travel tens of thousands of miles for them to be able to eat it. Um, and it's, it's all just to like feed these like larger industrial food systems that are trying to just, they're optimizing for profits. They're not optimizing for feeding people. Um, and so it makes, it just, it makes access to all of this so difficult. Um, and it makes um, access for the fishing folks really difficult because to get like certified and verified by a lot of these processors, distributors or whatever, you have to go through all these systems, um, pay your way into all of these programs. Um, and on top of, you know, just the, the cost of fishing, getting into fishing is already so high. Now there are all these like programs adding to it. It's just, it's getting super difficult for anyone except for the largest fleets to be fishing. Um, and in fact, um, from uh, during COVID, um, we, saw, we saw this directly because a lot of the international food, like just trade um, systems broke down and a lot of people were actually showing up to their docks, to their farms um, around them and asking for food. And <laughs> things were a lot easier, a lot more straightforward, a lot more direct. Um, and, you know, there's not like huge population. There's not like people falling left and right to mercury poisoning. There's not like all of these like terrible things you're told are gonna happen. In fact, a lot of the food was actually way healthier. Um, so, and, and, and I know um, Jason and Mel could definitely say a lot on that, but um, 
Yeah, and, and and then on the just like what what else is showing up in our grocery stores? We're see you see you see things like farm raised and um, happening a lot, and you see all these specific places um, referenced, um, like Faroe Island. I know is a big one for salmon. Um, but before I get into that, I just want I want y'all to like take a minute and just like like make some visions with me. Um, and just think of think of a farm and what are some of the animals you're seeing um, you know for folks in the U.S. I imagine like cows and chickens and pigs and stuff are some of the first um, and I imagine we go to more like like oh like large pasture rays where there you know a couple cows roaming around and just like having space and being able to relax more or less. Um, that's just not the reality of farmed fin fish because there will be like tanks of water, 50 million gallons of water, um, and there will be hundreds of thousands of pounds of fish in, in these tanks. Um, they are, there's wild amounts of fish in these small tanks. It's, it's much more akin to CAFO type situations incredible amount of fish packed into a really small area um and some of these are migratory fish that migrate like thousands and thousands of miles per like per season and now they get to spin in a circle for their whole lifetime like it's not and, and we're already seeing just like incredible decrease of nutrition we're seeing um incredible decrease of like you know um, genetic, uh, genetic um, diversity between the fish and all of these problems popping up. And yet we're being told this is like fin fish aquaculture is like the solution of the future. Um, so like when you, when you see those like farm raised um, salmon, farm raised shrimp or whatever, just like think about it for a second. Um, think of like how that could even be possible. Um, and this is not to group in farmed shellfish, um, which is like a good thing to just like separate in general. Um, and when we, like with our wild fisheries and such, there's so much in places where there aren't catch shares, there's still a lot of like community, like community-based fisheries are still like alive and thriving in a lot of spaces. And in fact, um, growing um, a lot um the local catch network obviously like there's a lot of beautiful work there to uplift and grow more community um community-based fisheries um and but but like it's hard to you know if you're thinking of those like large industrial systems you can't like penny pinch community-based fisheries but like with aquaculture which is explicitly privately owned like there's there's so many directions that they're trying to do this, whether it's like biotech aquaculture that's trying to make their own like first unique genetically engineered um, fish um, to kind of get their way into the door or this plant that's growing up in Nevada that's looking to be like the largest aquaculture facility. They're all just trying to get their leg up in this race of the most optimal, <laughs> sustainable um, facility. And, and there's a whole host of reasons to be worried about that, but I kind of want to end it with um, just like a way to frame what I see as like the most important danger of this. Um, if we think about Atlantic salmon, um, which is one of the more commonly like farm raised uh, fish, it's, it's endangered um, and it's, um, it needs like a lot of support and like love and help and care to come back to being um, like having as healthy runs as it used to be. Um, and there's there's a path to doing it. We know how to restore the Atlantic salmon populations. Like a lot of the indigenous uh, tribes of New England have been shouting this for decades of like, if you do this, the salmon will come back. Like the Penobscot have you know, been some of the, and many more, um, but Penobscot um, have been really working hard to remove a lot of the dams 
um, that are harming these fish populations. Um, and, and every time there's even the smallest dam removal or the smallest like source of pollution removal, there's like a big increase of Atlantic salmon return. But because there's this reality, you know, there's this narrative that like Atlantic salmon are dead, Atlantic salmon are done, you can't do anything about it. So we have to raise them in a farm. It just creates this mentality that there is nothing actually to be done. And we pour literally billions of dollars into this industry of it, like farm raised Atlantic salmon. But if like one one thousandth of that money was put into restoration of Atlantic salmon, we would have wild Atlantic salmon for like everyone again because it can be fixed. Just like our oceans, our oceans are facing a lot of harm and damage right now, and people are like, "Whatever, they're done." Here's the alternative. It's like, no, actually, let's keep working in the ocean so as to like fix it and fix our relationship with the ocean. Um, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that uh, really helped me conceptualize this, like when we were uh, working on the aquaculture report, which we released a while ago, I think uh, we have a link up to that in the chat, is just that same concept that Brett was talking about, about the commons, right? And aquaculture is another way of slicing up this public resource, which is the ocean and access to it, dividing it into little pieces and then taking very poor care of it and essentially ruining it for everybody else under the guise of private responsible ownership, right? Um, so kind of per the question, I saw this question in the chat about um, how do we know what fish are sustainable? Um, you know, it's a little easier when it comes to aquaculture and usually as a blanket rule, we can just say a farmed fin fish is the, the kind of um, the input output damage calculation on that is usually just not going to work out in favor of a farmed fish. Um, you're almost always better choosing a wild cut option. There are some rare exceptions when it comes to indoor recirculating farms, but in those cases, those people are very eager to give you all the information about how their product is different. Um, and you're, you know, uh, not as likely to run into it as just kind of unlabeled farmed products. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend if you have more questions about farmed fish, um, check out that uh, food print of uh, aquaculture report as well. Um, but yeah, thank you, John, for that. I mean, it's um, imports and exports are where things get so much more complicated with seafood. Um, so it's really good to kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, so as our kind of like last big question area, uh, and I wanna pose this to everybody, um, we have kind of detailed a lot of what is wrong with uh, the system as we see it, um, whether corporate consolidation, um, poor regulatory policies and everything else, um, for people who both work with other advocates and for people who have connections to fisher people themselves or fish themselves, um, Who's doing it right? What are you excited about? Um, what projects are you involved with or have you seen that are encouraging? Um, and how can other people get involved and support? Um, whoever feels like um, there have anybody who's- I'll jump in. I see Jason I'll... has unmuted himself here. So you can kick us off. Yeah, um, what I think is a real interesting um, fishery, and, and again, Rhode Island is, is very fortunate. Um, it's actually in our constitution that we get to have the right to the ocean and accessing the beach and rights to access, which is huge. But we also have an amazing um, hard shell clam fishery. You know, most people didn't even know what a quahog was until Family Guy came out. And everybody's like, oh, that's what a quahog is. Um, that fishery was was really, really thriving years ago with, I mean, an enormous amount of people in the fishery. Uh, it dropped back off, but, but the management of it has stayed relatively the same and continues to improve. And with water quality improvements, um, like the Providence River opened up for the first time in forever. 
and the biomass in there is enormous and it's been regulated really well where there's certain days it's open, certain days it's closed, certain times a year it's open, certain times a year it's closed. It's just, and it's been very beneficial. Um, I think that there are more, there are more fishermen banding together from, you know, different gear types as well and trying to work on connecting with NOAA to do cooperative research. Um, which is something that, that Brett had said earlier too. It's like, it blows my mind in the world of technology that we have, you know, still following this antiquated management system, antiquated fish counting system. And I think that's starting to change as well, looking at more eco-based, um, ecology-based management of a fishery, you know, and, and I, I have to laugh because I hadn't been up to Chatham in a very long time. And I, I went up there with a friend of mine and we started laughing as we were watching a couple, you know, they were tourists for sure, probably from Wisconsin or something. I could tell they were from the Midwest, but they said, wow, I didn't realize there were so many rocks here. And my buddy and I looked over and we started laughing. We said, those aren't rocks. Those are seals. They're like, what? See, yeah, those are seals. That's, but that's a whole other game. You know, it, it's more involvement in managing and in, in getting involved in policy changes. Like I, if you'd asked me 20 years ago, if I'd be doing this, I would have told you you're nuts. But I saw a lot of my mentors, you know, giving up. And, and, and now I see, you know, a lot of us are banding together and not giving up and we're pushing forward and, and asking for solutions and approaching, you know, senators and congressmen and local leaders and, and community leaders and um from you know the local municipal level up to i mean the trip we're doing next week with our catch share coalition to dc um and also when you get a win i mean i was jumping up and down and screaming after i heard about you know the pebble mine i was like it, it i got goosebumps now thinking about it it's a long fight but it's a huge win and just realizing that we, you know, been going to DC and talking to folks and, and we've gotten a couple of wins where it's like you, you, you get frustrated at first, but then you realize people are listening. Um, I think COVID as much as it was a curse was a blessing because I think more people want to know where their food's coming from. Um, and, and it's, it's growing momentum. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of my 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 bullet point would be cooperative research, real time management and regulatory you know changes. And and of course just the quota ownership that that whole thing needs to be discarded and and revamped and, and looked at. Um, we've got an interesting little discussion kind of along this point unfolding in the chat. Um, somebody asked, who controls more fisheries policy? federal government or is it the state government? Um, yeah. So I want to kind of bring that question in and kind of ask it as uh, advocates for people who fish, where is the logical place to kind of target your efforts here? Like who actually makes the most difference? And um, yeah. State fisheries or federal fisheries. And that's where it gets interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And then on top of that, even though I'm a state fisherman, I am still under the thumb of federal regulation. Um, it's, it's actually quite funny to me because I have four folders upstairs with all of the acronyms that have to do with fisheries management. Um, it would make your head hurt. So, but the list, it's, uh, it comes down to seven people we, seven, or, seven organizations we answer to, but the top you know, National Marine Fisheries Service, NOAA, and then on the East Coast, Atlantic States Marines Fisheries Council, New England Fisheries Council. And then you get to the local level, it's the Rhode Island Fisheries Council here in Rhode Island. Um, and that's where you start. I mean, at least for me, we start at the state. Um, I was actually chatting with one of the DEM employees while he was in um maryland at an asmfc meeting last night during a fisheries workshop so it's like their job's fairly complex as well 
but the 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 top the top tier is literally the the department of commerce which is even higher up so the highest up you can go to discuss fisheries would be getting a hold of Gina Raimondo at the Department of Commerce and saying, hey, I have a question about fisheries. Um, and then work your way from there. So not complicated at all. It's pretty simple, you know. Um, the answer here is kind of everybody all at yeah. once. And yeah. I just want to sell my uh, fish. <laughs> uh, in Alaska, it's a little simpler. Um, you know, the the nearshore fisheries are um, are managed by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and the, you know, once you get away from the nearshore environment um, out into the Bering Sea or Gulf of Alaska, that's when the feds come in through the uh, North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, and um, you know, which is managed under NOAA. And uh, thank you for mentioning the Department of Commerce. Basically, what's driving uh, what happens in um, you know, big the big water um, under federal jurisdiction. It's all it's all based on how how much money can be taken in for uh, the federal coffers, and um, the the guiding principle is maximum sustained yield. Um, through the state system, it's um, simply sustained yield, and it it's worked really well in Bristol Bay. Bristol Bay is um, is a fishery that was established when Alaska was still a territory um, in 1886. And, uh, you know, so that um, clearly something is being done right, uh, you know, because no enhancement has had to step into uh, to bring in the tens of millions of fish that return every year. This year we almost reached, um, well, we, we shattered the previous records of returns for sockeye salmon in Bristol Bay, um, we almost reached 80 million. Yeah, um, it, we've never gotten close to that before. Um, so it's really exciting to know that this, you know, this uh, fishery is just so so rich and still going strong. But unfortunately, one of the things that's happening um, with the state management level is that our governor. He, he does not seem to be a lover of uh, fish and sustainable um, economic drivers. And he's, he's really, you know, Alaska is a state that um, is resource driven. Um, and we, we, we do have a lot of mineral wealth and get oil and gas wealth um, that is still in the ground. And our governor is hell bent on um, developing the infrastructure that would allow all of Western Alaska to be raped, basically. Um, and uh, the budgets for uh, fish and game management in Alaska continue to be cut. And um, when budgets are cut, the, the managers, the area managers don't have, um, they're not able to get out and you know do the field research that's required and the counting of fish that's required in order to be guided by the sustained yield principle, which is basically you know don't catch more than half of what returns. Um, that's that's you know most simply put that's you know that that is what guides the sustained yield principle. Thanks. That is by far the simplest explanation I've ever heard anybody give of maximum sustainable yields, which if you've ever uh, taken a fisheries management or environmental economics course, you have sat there looking at that graph for a while and trying to find a, you know, summary as easy as that. So thank you for that. <clears throat> um, I wonder if you could talk about both uh, Sam and Melanie uh, returning to you for a minute. Um, what are you excited about kind of moving forward to other battles on the horizon after kind of securing this victory against the pebble mine um, through your activities at Salmon State? Mm, maybe excited isn't the best word. Uh, because Apprehensive. <laughs> these, big, these big battles are, are they're really daunting, but um, my um, Longtime colleague Lindsay Bloom and I, we have been um, doing our best to advise people in, in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta who have, they're staring at um, 
a big gold project at the headwaters of their most prolific stream, Crooked Creek, which uh, drains into the Kuskokwim River. And um, in the Yukon-Kuskokwim Delta, there is no longer a commercial fishery. Um, there hasn't been one for some time. And the people in that area have had to stand down from even their subsistence activities. Um, this morning, we were on a call with our friends in the region, and um, uh, my friend Gloria Simeon, um, she, she mentioned that uh, when there's no, no fish in the smokehouse, there's no hope. And, and the thing that um, I think is really important to stress here is that we're talking about people who still have a complete relationship with their environment. People who, who live in relation to the land, they hunt, you know, for, in the fall, they go for their moose, which helps get them through the winter. Um, in the summer, they're putting up fish, you know, they're drying fish, they're smoking fish. Um, freezing fish uh, so that they, they can make it through the winter. And the way that they, um, the economy exists, it's different than, than how we, we as modern people live, you know, in our houses with mortgages or rents and, um, you know, always buying all of our food from the grocery. Whereas like, you know, when you're talking about people who still have a complete relationship with their environment. They, their grocery store is the land. Their gross and the, and the waters, the rivers, the ocean, um, migratory birds, and uh, to not be able to bring in salmon is is devastating. And I, I think it's really important to point out for those of you who who don't know that sa you know salmon are anadromous. They they which means that they, they return to the fresh water from which they were born. But when they're about a year old, they go to sea and they, that's where they fatten up. And then they, they come back and they bring the, all of the nutrients that they ingested back to the land to kind of feed not only the people that catch them, but, but the land and all the other animals um, that exist in the environment that they return to. And it's important to take care of the the natal streams, but unfortunately, there's there's really bad stuff that's happening out in the ocean um, that prevents the return of these fish. And the people of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta are paying for that right now. But if this um, mine is built, it's going to also create a break in the um, the rearing environment to, of these salmon that the people rely upon and all of the other fish that um, aren't anadromous that are relied upon. The forage fish, as Johnny Fishmonger would uh, would celebrate, he's the, the forage fish um, awareness king. And, um, you know, in the case of the people on, on the Kuskokwim, they rely heavily upon rainbow smelt, which are also known as hooligan. Um, and barge traffic on that river would would devastate any of the um, spawning areas for the for those fish. I know I I, I brought a lot in there, um, but please please, our our friends in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta need everybody to be this this project is already permitted. Um, it was permitted in during the Trump era. There were a lot of considerations that weren't weren't. Um, or a lot of things that weren't taken into consideration that should have been. Um, <clears throat> and then the joint record of decision was signed off on the very day that uh, our governor received the, the record of decision. Um, and now the state is doing everything they can to, to grant the permits um, to allow this project to move forward. But um, our friends have, made enough noise that they're starting to kind of slow things down with the Army Corps of Engineers. So keep your eyes on Donlin. If you see an action item, take it, um, do what you can there. Um, it's definitely the next big fight. Um, and transboundary rivers too in Southeast Alaska, if you have time to take a look at the link for Salmon Beyond Borders, um, 
Northern BC is basically like um, in gold rush status right now. It's, it's like the Wild West. And uh, there's a reason why multinational corporations register in Canada. They're given a lot of leniency there. And um, so, uh, they, yeah, and there's some big projects that rival the size of the proposed pebble mine um, that stand to, to really impact some great rivers that, um, that feed fishermen and families. And um, so, so pay attention to that too. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a really kind of, uh, a kind of sad central irony here when we talk about, you know, people who are uh, living in a more complete relationship with nature. You know, what are we aiming for when we talk about eating more sustainably, whether it's seafood or other things, it's bringing our food system back into a more complete relationship with nature. But sadly, the people who are most threatened kind of by the onward march of the industrial food system and our society most broadly are the people who are already sort of living that way. Um, so that's an important thing to remember, I think, as we think about advocate, advocacy um, across the food system is taking our cues generally, um, specifically from indigenous communities and what they're prioritizing. Um, John and Brett, we'd love to hear from you on um, any of the other, I know that Jason kind of outlined a bunch of them, but if you've got any kind of specific things um, down the pipe that people should know about. Sure, yeah. I'll go. Um, okay, so I'm excited about a lot. Um, I'll also try and get, I know there's a question um, by, uh, by Madeline. I'll, I'll try and get your question in this too about support efforts. Okay, here we go. So last week we had this uh, exciting meeting. We brought a group of fishing folks together to go meet with some NPR reporters. And one of the fishermen with us was this guy named Corey Hendricks. He's younger. He's of the Wampanoag tribe. He does both wild harvest shellfish, like oysters and quahogs, and then also manages like a little plot of like small scale mariculture where he grows and tends to like his own seedlings of both oysters and coax. And he was, he painted this picture of hope uh, from his perspective that <clears throat> he sees a bright future for himself and the marine ecosystem he works in, his friends are getting involved. A part of his story, a big part of his story was his ability to begin connecting to people in the community, feeding them, but also getting paid a fair price. He's got his website up. Part of what we're seeing happen across, you know, from coast to coast is that technology is serving to allow harvesters, fishermen to connect more directly to people who want to support them. And that's really exciting. And so I think Corey's story kind of like captures a lot of these big picture kind of um, uh, what is it, like areas of NAMA's work that we're involved in. One of them is don't cage our oceans that we've brought up a little bit in the past where like, yes, a big aspect of it is just kind of blocking offshore kind of contained operating feed law, like these CAFO style fish farms and block that. And we want to be uplifting these local and regional supply chains that are centered around people who are, you know, independent and uh, feeding their communities first, people like Corey, right? So there's this piece of legislation that's afoot that we're working uh, with congressional members around to design like a, a bill that would enhance local and regional supply chains. It's super duper exciting. This year, hopefully we'll be able to share a lot more. Uh, folks should follow um, Don't Cage Our Oceans, you know, stay in the loop on that front because it's it's a really exciting moment. Another aspect of our work is the local catch network that's been highlighted in the chat. We had this big uh, national gathering in Alaska last fall where hundreds of uh, these kind of, you know, hundreds of the Jasons and the Melanies and the Corys and folks who are doing more direct sales, feeding their communities and their regions first, were all there sharing best practices and building on each other and kind of uplifting this kind of like movement of values driven seafood supply chains. It's super duper exciting. I know in the chat earlier too, maybe it was, this was um, Madeline as well, asking the question, like I'm in Chicago, what do I do? 
it there is something to be said that like you know we we do not want to forget about the landlocked states that uh you know we talk about yes it's it's important to value like direct access and go down to the docks what we are seeing now is that more independent fisher centered businesses are are kind of creating direct side, uh, supply chains into the middle of the country, which is really exciting. If you go onto localcatch.org, there's a map. And on that map, you can kind of like see like all these plot lines. I think there's one right in Chicago, uh, which is great. And hopefully with like more momentum, we'll get to see these little you know dots all over the country where people can find access to this values-based, values-driven seafood. The other, uh, and then someone like Corey was you know plugged into that. And then uh, there's a, a budding or a thriving Slow Fish network that's an offshoot of Slow Food, Slow Fish. It's really exciting, a, a kind of space to both celebrate the story of the people behind the fish and celebrate what Jason mentioned, like the underloved species, all these you know abundant species that folks have like been removed from, don't know about. Slow Fish is a space to celebrate with chefs and people who love seafood to come together and tell stories. And there's an effort afoot over this next year to kind of do um, this campaign called the Rising Tide, where people all over the country can kind of participate and enjoy uh, and like fun activities to celebrate seafood. Uh, so that's in the mix as well. And uh, and then for the last, the last question about like getting involved, especially to fight some of this corporate takeover stuff. I think the easiest, well, maybe one thing everyone could do, uh, leaving this webinar higher up on the link, maybe we could relink it, the story that broke this past summer about this company, Bragel Private Equity, was huge. It's a big narrative shifting moment for us as NAM and our, our group of advocates and fishermen who are fighting for this. Pointing to that is critical and just sharing it. You know, if anyone could like share that, share that on your social media, if you're into it, share it. Uh, over email and just helping spread the word is is a good starting point. And then to, staying connected, stay connect, connect with us at NAMA on social media, um, go onto our website and join our newsletter. We aim to be providing action opportunities over the course of this year and next year, specifically around the Catch Share Reform Advocacy of a Little Catch Share Reform Coalition. And we want to be asking people, both in the public, you know, folks involved in the local catch network, so fish network, all over to help help us build, you know, power behind the asks that we have. So we we appreciate it. Thank you. You, John. No, I mean that really captures it. Um, and I want to highlight something. I you know I see some of the other folks who are involved in Black Corporate Salmon on here too, and just want to like re-emphasize that. Um, and specifically. For folks in the Midwest, they're trying to build their new facility in Ohio, and um, that's kind of like been one of our like, you know, one of our like big fights is just like make sure that facility in Ohio does not come to be because um, Aquabounty is a genetically engineered like salmon producing company. It's not really salmon; <laughs> it's whatever they want to call it. Um, and so, and and their one of their other facilities is actually in um, southern Indiana. Um, so we always need more support of folks in the communities there. Um, so check out, um, as well as Nama social media and everything. Check out the Black Corporate Salmon uh, social media um, and all the the struggles for the salmon people there. Thanks everybody for sharing those. Um, no shortage of great ways to get involved. Um, so as we move into this Q and A portion, I want to just give everybody one final kind of lightning round question, um, and that is if you could drill one thing into just kind of a layperson's head um, about wild seafood, what would it be? Can I jump in? Go for it. So. Um, we switched to plant farming thousands of years ago. We switched to animal farming thousands of years ago. 
And then, and both of them <laughs> led to drastic global changes. Um, and, you know, whether you want to talk about Roman Empire, Ottoman Empire, whatever, I mean, talking two different eras. But then we saw with industrial animal agriculture, um, that, that like shaped like world history too, in a lot of ways, but mainly um, <laughs> carbon in the air being a huge one. Um, and it, it has been a pivot point that has just shifted us on a track that is borderline impossible to undo. Um, and we now just have to think of new ways to deal with the problems of that. And we have not made that mistake in the seafood space yet. And we can stop it from happening, but people are trying to make it happen. So this is, and like, you know, while we're doing it, we're getting amazing local seafood as the alternative. So we can go industrial and large and face a lot of terrifying things or have good local seafood. <laughs> so that's my thing. It's a tenuous enough time on planet Earth. We really don't need to be inventing another kind of high impact agriculture. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to put it. Uh, Melanie, I can see that you're unmuted there. You have your yeah. one, one big takeaway. Yeah, I've already kind of touched uh, touched upon it, but habitat habitat matters. Consider the habitat, whether you're talking about the terrestrial environment that salmon return to or the ocean environment that they feed in. Um, and if, if a gear type is degrading habitat, or if there are other factors degrading habitat, do what you can to curb that. Or if, you know, if there's a threat to important habitat, oh, like waters in Bristol Bay. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Brett or Jason, any big, big takeaways for people? Yeah, I have to go on, you know, right on Melanie's thunder here with the, the habitat part. Um, Rhode Island has, I think, a little over 400 miles of coastline. And we're, you know, the biggest little state in the union. Um, we've been working on a local level to try to educate people about what they spray on their lawns. So we have salt ponds and estuaries and um, had, to, had a gentleman who was, you know, built some of the most amazing trawl nets in the world say to me, at a conference, he said, boy, you're an anomaly, he says, because you fly fish in a trout stream for native brook trout, but you're offshore tuna fishing. Well, if people can remember that all of it is connected and that the garbage you're dumping on your lawn for fertilizer because you want this pretty green lawn and all of this stuff that you're putting into the soil or putting into the sewage system or septic system you know, my dad would say, you know, it rolls downhill. Um, and as my wife would say, too, she's been watching me deal with this fight for years. I mean, she's put up with me now for 30 years and she, she starts laughing at some of this stuff, you know, when she hears about ocean use policy and spatial planning and blue economy. And she says, haven't we screwed up the land enough already? And now we want to go screw up the ocean. You know, so it's, it's again, people need to pay attention and really, you know, a lot of times people don't think what they do has a big impact and they just get complacent. But if everybody would stop having chem lawn sprayed and either plant a garden or just do what I do, I have a beautiful lawn made out of weeds and clover and uh, it does fine all on its own. Doesn't need much help and keeps the bees happy. But we have to get, you know, I think the term I kind of coined was, uh, it, it's, we have to go backwards. We, we literally have to do a double take and start over. And it's, you know, positive regression. You know, let, let's go backwards to go forwards. Um, like John had said, you know, it's, we started out okay. And then somebody got greedy, said, let's make as much money as we can. Well, we're paying the price in a, big way across the board. So yeah, pay attention to what you're doing right in your own community because it does have an impact. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Um, okay, my uh, parting thought in a concise, <laughs> I, I think uh, draw the parallels family to family farming. 
we compare the family, the experience of family farmers that so many of us know is directly parallel to the experience of family fishers. And we're all part of a food system. Um, and in the same way that it makes sense to just try your best to connect as closely as you can to your food producer, it's just better. It's also important to acknowledge there's there's privilege aspects to, to food. And I think my parting thought would be this, that Jason mentioned there, there's so many species that are doing great, that are abundant, that are well cared for, but you know, John mentioned this too, you know, the majority get exported far, far, far away. The average distance traveled of seafood here is 5,500 miles. And there's this amazing win-win scenario that can happen if we kind of can connect these dots between abundant local species that people actually love. And we can help create simpler supply chains. And the fisher can get paid more and the people eating it can have to pay less. It's like an amazing concept. And it started as, you know, so how do we start? I think it does start by, there's a kind of eater demand kind of thing, right? Like you have to get educated, you have to know the fish, you have to ask the fish, try and work together to help, you know, build it. It's not an easy task, right? But the vision of moving in that direction, I think is something we can all be part of. And right now, you know, local catch is sort of the hub trying to help make that happen. So I encourage everybody, check out localcatch.org. Um, thank you all for that. Someone in the chat also, uh, Nia has highlighted uh, One Fish Foundation as well when it comes to um, sort of helping people understand just kind of how all of that works. Um, I have a few questions that we accumulated during the, uh, in the chat over the course of the Q and uh, over the course of the panel presentation um, that I want to go through. But I also uh, want to just kind of open the floor up. Um, to anybody who's got a question, um, you want to use the the raise hand function, I think is probably the easiest way to do it. Um, or you can um, send, um, if you want to send a direct message to um, the North American Marine Alliance um, in the chat, um, we'll flag it and then you can go on camera and um, ask a question there as well. Um, but so starting out with some of these uh, chat questions, um, I want to dive a little more into just like this broader thing of how to um, shop at a supermarket. Um, what are, you know, if we don't have super hard and fast rules and like, you know, if you're already working um, in this alternative territory where you don't have easy connections to your local fishing community. Um, if you're in a grocery store, what are like some very basic kind of red flag, green flag, yellow flag investigate further? If anybody has any thoughts on that, uh, just like very basic rules of thumb. And that was something that I know we uh, put a lot of effort into as we were thinking about the report, just like how do we distill some of this? Um, so yeah, if anybody's got any big thoughts there. So I, I'll, I'll kick it off, um, but it's important to know that there's not just one place to look for fish in your grocery store. Um, you know, of course, there's the fish counter, the fresh fish counter where, where you see fillets on ice um, or like in packaging um, to the side of the fish counter. But do not forget the, the tinned fish section and your and the freezer section. Um, if you're shopping in the freezer section, you can either look for Alaska, an Alaska label, or you can look for a wild label. If you see that um, the fish is ID'd as sockeye, you know for sure it's wild uh, because sockeye. Nobody's been able to figure out how to farm sockeye salmon. Um, or hatch them in the case of hatcheries or, or you know, enhance fisheries enhancement. Um, if you're lo looking in the, the tinned fish aisle, uh, whenever you see bumblebee seafoods, um, 
you know, but, but that's that's Alaska salmon. Um, you know, if you're looking for salmon, um, let me see. Like any of it, your pink is going to be the most economical, and don't underestimate it. Pink canned pink salmon actually tastes quite good. You know, yeah. when eating it fresh, people may not it may not be their favorite, um, but it cans really well. It's very flavorful. Make sure you eat the bones. They're so healthy for you. Um, such a good source of calcium. And don't pour the, the liquid off because there's a lot of, there are a lot of good omega-3s in that liquid and a lot of flavor. Um, so uh, yeah, if you, and then if you're shopping in the fresh counter, um, there is a chance that even though it looks like it's fresh ne and never frozen, it may have been refreshed. Unfortunately, there are um, the food print of uh, sockeye salmon can be kind of bad some, sometimes in the case of Bristol Bay because when the when the fish come through, they come through hard and fast. And a lot of times the processors can't keep up and fully process. So what they do is they just head and gut. And that's the product form that is sent overseas to China for reprocessing and refreezing. Um, so fresh isn't always best, um, but there are certain things you can look for. And then another thing I should mention um, is that if you visit the BBRSDA website, Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association, if, if you are looking for Bristol Bay sockeye, they, they have a list of um, grocery store chains and direct marketers that sell, um, they either have subscribers or they, they sell at um, fish markets, um, you know, or, or I mean, not fish markets, but farmer's markets. So um, you can look up a guide and see if there's a place that's close enough to where you live um, so that you can go and support fishermen and um, eat healthy, healthy salmon. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, anybody, it, you know, I think the the one of the obvious kind of red flags for me um, is Atlantic salmon. You basically cannot buy wild Atlantic salmon because you know those populations are under so much threat that there is not an operational fishery for them. So if you see Atlantic salmon, that is a farmed product. So that would be a red flag for me most of the time. <clears throat> but thank you for all of those. Uh, that also you ended up kind of answering one of our follow-up questions, which was about um, affordability as well. If we're kind of prioritizing wild-caught fish, particularly if your focus is on uh, fresh, it's quite easy to spend your entire paycheck very quickly. And, you know, it will be delicious, but um, I think great to fit in that perspective on, you know, canned flash frozen options as being just as good if they're well-sourced. So, um, we got a great question in here about uh, policy and the Farm Bill, um, which I don't know if most people uh, in attendance know this, but the Farm Bill is the big um, omnibus piece of food policy legislation that Congress reauthorizes every five years. Uh, it is a Farm Bill year, and it is looking like it's going to be a bitterly contentious and difficult one. Um, in addition to kind of all of the food and farm subsidies, a lot of things like um, nutrition assistance uh, through SNAP and other programs are kind of all on the docket. Um, so the question is, how do fisheries and wild fisheries fit into the Farm Bill? Um, and what are the priorities of organizations like NAMA as we move into a Farm Bill year? Yeah, I can take that one. Yeah, great question. So, so NAMA has, uh, we call it a shared leadership model where we share resources with what, like a, a sister organization called the National Family Farm Coalition, who brings together you know, farm and farmer members from all over the country advocating on things like fair price and all, all the same you know concepts that we're talking about right now. So they are actively working on the farm bill. I encourage folks to check out their website. They're prioritizing issues like uh, like land land grabbing, protecting kind of the rights and affordability of people who farm to stay in the land to acquire new land. Um, they are working on SNAP. They're working on fair price issues. 
Um, they're working uh, with the kind of on USDA policy. They can channel money to uh, you know farmers and communities who need it, with also a focus on um, Black, Indigenous, and communities of color who farm. Uh, and on uh, almost all those fronts, we're building synergy with uh, our fishing communities and leaders like uh, Jason. We're going to DC next week, and we're actually going to sync up with the National Family Farm Coalition to attend some of these meetings and to be able to talk about uh, you know, you know the, the land grabbing concept is also happening on the ocean. This is how it's showing up. Um, but in a very practical level, um, we are piggybacking to ensure that SNAP benefits and accessibility includes seafood and that we're incentivizing seafood to be part of that uh, when it comes to the country of origin labeling, which is really important for all of our foods. We're making sure that seafood is also a part of that. Um, and we're making sure this is a really bright spot, a big bright spot actually in the farm bill. Um, the Agriculture Marketing Service is a branch of the USDA. They give out a lot of money to incentivize <laughs> different areas of growth in our food system. And that can be used you know, <laughs> to align with our values or not, but more and more and through work, you know, through work with folks like National Family Farm Coalition, they are channeling money very effectively to enhance local and regional supply chains. Uh, and, and we're entering those conversations to make sure they're also enhancing seafood supply, local and regional seafood supply chains. And it's a really exciting moment. And we've really appreciated the support for USDA around the values that we've been talking about this whole time. And so that's another big piggybacking moment. We want to make sure that money will be part of the, the current farm bill. And we feel pretty confident it will. Yeah, I mean, from a, coming at it, you know, from my experience is more on the agriculture side of things, that idea that we can use the nutrition policies in the farm bill to expand people's access to seafood and help out producers is one of those like really exciting kind of win-win scenarios. Um, so it makes sense that we'd be excited about that from the seafood angle as well. Um, we did have one raised, actually we have two raised hands. Um, we had Madeline, I think, wanting to ask a question. Um, so um, if we can unmute her and um, give her the chance to ask that. Hi, um, this is Madeline and I appreciate uh, being able to thank all the panelists and the leader myself um, for a very uh, important number of points you made. I wanted to add to Melanie's um, list of alternative uh, ways of shopping for fish, uh, fresh oysters, shucked oysters in a container. Uh, I get them from the West Coast and uh, I try to buy them, the Chesapeake Bay ones too, but they aren't always available. I have a rule of thumb that um, I won't buy salmon that costs less than $10 a pound because it seems to me that there's no way that it can be come to, come to my store without having sacrificed uh, the oceans and the communities around the oceans. Uh, but that's really all. Just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate you. it. You've had some really great questions along the whole process that really helped the discussion kind of take shape there. So thank you for participating. Um, we had another raised hand from, I think, Emma. Um, yep. All right, go Excuse ahead. Me. Uh, hi, Melanie. Hi, uh, John. I know some of you folks. Uh, I am here in Alaska, and my husband and I are salmon gill netters in Prince William Sound. Uh, it's been a fantastic thing to do together, but it did come to a point where both breadwinners couldn't have the same job. It wasn't sustainable. So I recently had to step out of my full-time position. And uh, so now, you know, I go out on the boat for a few months, right? All of these years, we've realized that our best customers are right in our own Alaskan community. And 
prior to that, we took a business accelerator thinking, let's find those markets. Well, shipping is not ideal, right? Especially when you have such a wonderful fresh product. So we realized that we had all these tools to discover markets away, but it was our own little ski town just outside of Anchorage that Girdwood, some of you might just visited. That was the place where people needed fish. You can't buy it in a grocery store unless you're catching it yourself. There's, there's probably not any at Costco or the grocery stores in Anchorage. So it was wonderful to find this market. But over the course of the years with our fishery, um, Prince William Sound is big. There's a couple of harbors on each side. Some of those towns like Cordova, it is a fisherman's dream community. Whittier, Alaska is the opposite. And so I'm, I'm just raising this as a point of here I am, a sustainable fisher person wanting to share our catch. And we can't haul it up the docks without cranes. We can't keep it fresh without ice. We can't get it down the one roadway in Alaska to the processors. And when we get it to the processors, they're understaffed. And we watch our fish sit there. We've turned around and taken them back. And then what we do is we go back to the harbor and we head them, or sorry, we gut them and bleed them because that's what we're allowed to do. So the wonderful part of this is that now when we can, we sell whole gutted and bled fresh fish and people learn how to fillet it. They use the heads. They put the compost in their garden. So it's like a wonderful realization, but with a, a bad way of getting here. And so I just, I love, I, I joined this today to be re-inspired because my other job doesn't have the same, you know, pull to the oceans and to our food systems. So thank you for hosting this. And I know like other times when I've reached out to try to be a part of it and I've, I've fallen away, you may wonder why, but I'm still here and we're still trying. So it's all about those working waterfronts, trying to keep land to support communities for food security, you know, and this is on the right track. So it's great to be a part of this. Thank you, Emma. I'm so glad that you brought in the, the uh, concept of selling your fish whole, um, make it, you know, after ensuring that it's bled really well. Um, I just, I think the practice of fully utilizing a fish is really important for you know starting at a micro level with yourself and the value of not wasting anything and you know hopefully that will grow outward to you know all fishing practices and not wasting or taking for granted any part of the fish and the the nutrition that it can provide um carl wassily's brother uh, um, if you didn't read it in the chat, I love that he um, he said that he pressure cooks the the backbones so he can make really good bone broth and um, and then it the, it's the pressure cooking that makes the bones um, you know you're able to chew through the bones and get that that good calcium um, and extra oil that's housed in the bones. But thanks for bringing that in, Emma. And Emma, thanks for bringing the emotion into it because uh, the, the passion and the emotion to it is is 90% uh, of why we do this. And I, I, I feel you. Um, there aren't many moments where we have any of these meetings where somebody's not crying or upset because it's our life. You know, the old timer said this to me a long time ago. F fishing isn't what we do, it's who we are. So when you have to step away from it to do something else to pay your mortgage and feed your family, I get it. Yeah, thank you, Emma, for that <clears throat> perspective. Um, one final question. I think we've sort of answered this in part, but I just wanna dive into it explicitly. Uh, somebody raised the question of how can we know when things are, so they asked this specifically about farmed fish, but I think it applies to all fish. Um, how do we know what's sustainable when certification systems um, really operate on this pay for play structure? You know, I think we've seen over the last few years, many of the big certifying agencies um, controversies around how essentially if a fishery gives them enough money that they will certify them um, regardless of what their actual practices are. So, um, yeah, what are what are people's uh, general thoughts on certification systems? And as people who fish, are they worth it to you, or are they just sort of prohibitively expensive to be a part of? 
Uh, I can take a quick crack at it. <laughs> we were out on a, a boat a couple of weeks ago in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and there was a mackerel fisherman. He, small boat, you know, hook and line, owner operator, you know, feeding, you know, feeding has been been involved a long time. Just like the most eth ethical fisherman I can imagine, he knows the ecosystem really well. And uh, he said his mackerel doesn't. It's not kind of like reaching the bar for some of the mainstream certification schemes. It's not the green light, it's not certified and Whole Foods wouldn't really buy it because he's getting lumped in with others in the industry who operate at a very large scale who macro fish. And so, so and we see this happening on the farm side too, right? Like farmers who cannot afford the organic label. I think we're all as a public becoming more aware that that's a, a concern. So I think I just take them with a grain of salt. You know, I think consider them, they're, they're good starting points. There's some good like background information you can learn from some of these labels about the fish, but take them with a grain of salt, apply your own values, know that they don't go deep enough necessarily. They don't get to this who question that we are really emphasizing about who controls, who's really behind, you know, the business matters. Um, so yeah, so, we're okay. <laughs> but go deeper if you can. Good starting point, but not the be all end all of sustainability that maybe they want them to be. Something, Melanie, did you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, something that really bothers me about um, fishery certification programs is that I don't think, I, I feel like they're very siloed and they're only looked upon by you know species and fit fishing area and they don't take into consideration enough how they may be impacting other fisheries and abundance of other, other fish stocks. Uh, for example, uh, I find it hard to believe that the Pollock fishery continues to be certified and lauded as a sustainable fishery when, okay, sure, there's no denying that the biomass for the Pollock fishery is very strong that there, there's plenty of pollock, but the taking of pollock impacts a host of other species. And when that happens, certifying bodies need to consider that more and hold those fisheries accountable. Um, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because I think in Alaska, you certainly have a front row seat to some of these operations that are currently operating sustainably, but appear to be on a crash course towards not and kind of dramatic, <clears throat> dramatic consequences there. Um, well, I think we've answered most of the questions that uh, we've seen so far, um, and I'm not seeing any other raised hands. Um, so I think uh, we are going to wrap up here. Um, just wanted to remind everybody that um, one, I think it's already in the chat, but we have a link to the survey. Uh, we'd love to hear more about what you thought about this webinar and what you'd like to hear from future content from us, um, both NAMA and Foodprint about um, wild fish and fisheries. Um, <clears throat> we'd also invite you to check out uh, the food print of wild seafood that um, we worked so hard on. Um, it's a great resource to share with uh, people who want to know more. Um, yeah, it looks like we've just had all of those um, posted in the chat as well. So, um, oh, we have one last minute question. Um, okay, as a chef, I'm interested in how EKGMA can be used by the small community-based fishermen to maximize quality and nutrition and sustainability in comparison to industrial fish producers, especially for showcasing lesser eaten species. Somebody want to- I'd love to jump on this one. <laughs> Just because of this, um, going to be working with um, a professor from URI and a few others on an EKGMA project in Rhode Island specifically targeted at underutilized species and educating people about the difference in the quality and also 
actually doing demonstrations and having chefs and restaurants participate in demonstrations. The fish will be donated. Um, and it's uh, kind of a collaboration between the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, URI, and Eating with the Ecosystem. And we will be hopefully starting that project soon, uh, hopefully in May. And I think it is something that really needs to be looked at because um, we bleed, I bleed all of my fish anyway, and I've been using the Ikejime method for quite a few years without realizing that I was actually doing it correctly. <laughs> um, but there's gonna be classes for fishermen to take to learn it from the Ikejime um, Institute. And it's, it's being funded and I'm looking forward to doing it because the quality of those fish is so much better um, and it doesn't increase the value. So from a restaurant standpoint, especially if I can get them a direct sold Ikejime fish from my boat to them, the price is gonna be well worth it. Um, they won't have to pay $15 a pound for this fish. Can you uh, give just a quick, like 20 second explanation of what the Ikejime method is oh, for that are unfamiliar? So it's a more merciful way of um, of killing a fish. And it also, it, it's similar, I, I compared it to Kobe beef. Um, the fish is immediately slaughtered. So as soon as the fish comes on board, you actually spike the brain. Um, and then you run a small wire or a piece of uh, tapered monofilament down the spine and bleed the fish and then immediately put it in a ice slurry salt water. Um, from there, then you put it into, you know, ice or some people even will bag the fish and then put it in ice so no water touches it after that. But it's, it's amazing what the fish lasts longer, the shelf life is longer, and the quality and taste of the fish is much better. Sounds like a win-win to me. Absolutely. Um, oh, yeah, and we've got a more in-depth explanation in the chat as well. Um, yeah, um, all right. Well, I think that wraps up all the questions. I wanna say thank you again to our panelists, uh, Brett, Melanie, Jason, John had to step out a few minutes, or, um, but we really appreciate your time and expertise on this, um, as well as you know for um, helping connect us back to why this all matters. Um, and a huge thank you to everyone um, who both came with questions and feedback and for just listening. Um, yeah. Thank you.